No, this is quite true. I'm not, I'm not putting it down. You have to, when you're reading poetry, for one thing, you have to have an innate sense of rhythm. Because a man as an actor doesn't mean he has that. Uh, the best do, of course. Uh, but another thing that a good poetry reader must have is a, is the ability to er erase himself, submerge himself like a like a like a uh, like an iceberg, you know, submerge himself in the icy waters of the poem itself. In other words, the character of the writer is far more important in poetry than the character of the actor, and uh, that ain't easy to do when you're you know when you're when you're Peter Sellers or something. When, when most most people you know most actors think that the theater is about actors and ain't about plays, and uh, of course directors think uh, the theater is about directors. <laughs> you know, so so up and down it goes, and so eventually you'll find that very few actors really read poetry well. They they have trouble with it, and uh, this this piece of poetry, and it is that in its own only way, it is written with. Uh, a, a, a beautifully controlled tongue-in-cheek attitude. Now, the tongue-in-cheek attitude often gets out of control when people try to do it. And uh, this guy does it well. But I'll show you. Now, listen carefully to his rhythms in this thing. His use of... Ah, yes. Jersey City. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee when I'm downtown and the stench invades my nose. I love thee when I walk through streets where garbage stains my clothes. I love thee by the factories that spew forth filth and grime. I love thee down by City Hall which spews forth naught but crime. I love thee when they pave around the cars parked in the street. I love thee in the summer when the tar sticks to my feet. I love thee, the quaint, pristine beauty and the quaint charm I adore. But if thou floated out to sea, I'd love thee even more. I see. <laughs> All right, that's that's fine. <laughs> now, now the the great master of of the put down poetry uh, was well, he was he was a poet, I guess. Uh, it's hard to say uh, what he was, really. You know, people who make you laugh rarely ever get any credit for being any good. They have a little special niche. In, uh, unless you happen to be fey. Now, if you're very fey, and with just a little touch of lilac water about what you do, then you are honored for being fantastic. Lewis Carroll is an example of that. He's got a certain fey, itsy-bitsy, little boy, little girl quality. That, that appeals to large numbers of people who love to write books on the inner meanings of Winnie the Pooh. Uh, <laughs> that's another, the same kind of bit, you know. And, and when, you, when, you, when you write with, when you write with, with, a, with a kind of, of a sardonic virility, you will hardly ever get anywhere in that world, particularly if you make people laugh. Uh, and especially if you use genuinely the vernacular of the time. Uh, of course, Lewis Carroll used the vernacular of his time, and incidentally, he was not nearly as applauded as he is now, when the vernacular of his time seems far quainter and more interesting, and, uh, well, it's further away from us in time. So it, it, it begins to have a style that it pr quite probably did not have in the days when Carroll was writing. The man I'm talking about here is Don Marquis. Uh, Marquis will never be will never be uh, <laughs> will never be applauded particularly because Marquis, of course, is one of these people who again uh, used the language of the streets and he made you laugh always, and that's not good. Uh, and particularly, he <laughs> he he did it in an unobtrusive way. Uh, here, the lesson of the moth is an example. You ever hear that one? The lesson of the moth. I, and, and, of course, he wrote in, in, uh, in a strange way. He, uh, Don Marquis always wrote strange uh, in the sense that he, he had a form that was really, he developed all of his own. You know, it's, for years, uh, people have done this. Swift did it. Swift had, uh, you might say, non-human objects talk in human terms. Thereby, uh, he was able to say many things which he could not have said had he had a man say them. People would resent it. Say, ah, oh, what's he got? What axe is he grinding? Uh, and so as long as you have a non-human creature talking, you can practically move in any direction. You can say practically anything. Have you ever seen those little, those little comic strips underneath the big comic strips? You know, where they have, uh, 
like uh, oh, the, the guy that has a bad skin, you know, the kid's always there and he's looking in the mirror and says, oh, gee whiz, I wish I could do something about these hickeys. Oh, wow. You know, that thing. And, and, uh, and somewhere along the line, a little green parrot will stand up on the, on the shower curtain and say, why don't you try your friendly grocer? He'll do something about how you smell. You know, that kind of thing. Well, you would never take that from anyone else. You hit him in the eye. I mean, uh, you know, so they have a little parrot that says it, or a little owl. They, it, it, you know, some inanimate object, or not inanimate, but at least non-human. And so uh, Don Marquis wrote in, in the, uh, a cockroach. He had his cockroach that, that always was leaving poems in his typewriter. And he would come into the office all the time. He was a sports writer primarily, you know. And he would come into the office, and there would be a poem from, from Archie. And Archie was always hanging around with this cat named Hittable, who was the office cat. And uh, Archie was constantly talking to who, the, the guy he called Dear Boss. And Boss, of course, was uh, Don Marquis. And here, you, you give me a, give me a, I'll tell you, get Tiger Rag up for this, this, this crowd. Uh, this, <laughs> this, is a, this is a very different crowd. He has a, a great one in here about the toad, if I can find it here. The Dissipated Hornet. I kind of like that one. Well, Boss, I had a great example of the corrupting influence of the great city brought to my notice recently. A drunken hornet blew in here the other day and sat down in the corner and dozed and buzzed. Not a real sleep, you know. One of those wakeful liquor trances with the fuzzy talk oozing out of it. To hear this guy mumble in his dreams, he was right wicked. My name, he says, is Krusty Bill. I've never been licked and I never will. And then he'd go halfway asleep again. You know, the way nobody around here, nobody around here wanted to fight him. And after a while, he got sober enough to know how drunk he'd been, and he began to cry over it and get sentimental about himself. Mine is a wasted life, he says. But if I had a good start, ruined, red liquor ruined me, he says, and sobbed. <laughs> you want to hear the story? All right, cut it out there, man. And uh, I'll, I'll find if I can. Because this is one, that was one of his longer ones, the story of the dissipated hornet. And by the way, it is said by people who knew Don Marquis, and there have been a few fairly decent books about him, but people don't write official books about American writers. Uh, they really don't. Official books are written about, say, uh, oh, Racine. You'll write an official book about Proust. You'll write an official book about the uh, European writers, but, but nobody really writes official books. Have you noticed that since Hemingway died, there's just been a whole lot of junk written about Hemingway? I knew Hemingway once stuff. And then they go on, and it's kind of... Uh, uh, the, the worst, the worst uh, type of, uh, of uh, offender in this department are magazine writers who all feel a vague feeling of inferiority that they are magazine writers, and somehow they like to p picture themselves. Have you noticed the peculiar predilection that people have today, particularly writers, some writers, who have today to relate themselves to non-writing talent? Have you noticed that Hemingway somehow vaguely thought he was a defrocked bullfighter? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that there are at least 55 bad writers who like to believe that if they had grown another seven and a half feet tall, if they weighed another 45 pounds, had muscles and talent, they would be uh, Rocky Marciano. How many guys like... <laughs> if you know, and, and, and let me tell you the saddest fact of it all. As, as a writer, I can tell you this. I have a little credentials in this field. That by and large, uh, the, the writing fraternity is the least physically capable fraternity I've ever known in my life. They really are. Uh, that by and large, the writer, by the mere fact that at the age of 15 he was driven to sit in the corner and write odes, uh, makes him a very different guy from the guy who was out sinking hook shots at the same time. And by the time they grow up, they always wind up to be five feet three like Mailer, you know, or four feet nine like Baldwin, and dream of being fighters. They like to see themselves moving around the ring of the literary world, uh, trading left jabs, you know. Saul Bellow is fighting it out with, <laughs> with, with J.D. Salinger, see. And two young challengers, Philip Roth and, and, uh, Philip Roth and J.P. Donlevy are warming up out there, you know. They're putting the rosin on their gloves and they're going... <laughs> and now, of course, the, the new bit in this, I don't know whether you're interested in this thing, or this, but it's, it's a fascinating thing to me. Uh, the new bit, of course, is women who are beginning to do this now. 
and there are at least a half dozen uh, writing type women who say, uh, Alkin stalked into the office, he walked like a fighter. You know, the kind of old fighter that you see hanging around clubs with this tobacco juice coming out of his feet, you know, the old kind of fighter, a little half punchy but still game, ready to go in there, you know, as, <laughs> as if they themselves were hanging around two-bit uh, punchy fighters in little crummy clubs out in Trenton someplace, you know. And, and this is, this is a, somehow, I have a feeling, and this is just a, just a passing feeling, I have a feeling that, that, the, that the intellectual, which after all is what a writer is, even if he writes junk, he intellectualizes. That does not necessarily mean he is. See, we confuse intellectual with thinker quite often. They ain't the same thing. That quite often an intellectual can be a man who totally intellectualizes all of his experiences. That is, he puts them down in a written form, or he has to somehow live uh, vicariously. More and more people are interested in reading about uh, things, reading about sex, for example, than doing it. Uh, yeah, this is, yeah, that's right. You'd be surprised, son. <laughs> this is called intellectualizing. And, and uh, I suspect that, that as the writer, he's an intellectual, as, especially when he begins to lose his touch, especially when he begins to lose the, the ability to have anything to say about the world around him, when he begins to feel that his powers are failing, he quite often has a terrible urge to be exactly the opposite of what he was all of his life, a writing man. And, and uh, yes, because he, he, he relates himself, if you notice, most fighters, most, most writers, excuse me, relate themselves with punch-drunk ex-fighters. Uh, they like to think of themselves as hard-bitten, grizzled, tough, hard-fighting characters. And, and this, is, this, is a, this is kind of a tragic thing to see it happening. And uh, you, you, you find that as, as and I've, I've seen many magazine writers, particularly of the Esquire ilk, uh, many of them uh, never had much power from the beginning. Tall, willowy young men who wrote little funny bits in the Yale Journal, you know, that kind of thing. And they, they finally drift out into the great wide world out there, and they find they can't write. They're not very good writers at all. They have nothing to say, nothing to write about. So they write about writers. This is, this is the quickest way to get yourself a name as a writer, is to asso associate yourself with a real writer. And so you write endless things about Hemingway. Uh, you write endless things about uh, who knows what, you know. And, and the saddest kind of guy is the guy who once wrote a book and has never been able to write a book since. He, he winds up then imitating other greater writers than himself. I'm surprised they haven't picked up Melville yet. And all gotten a job in the customs department here of New York City, which is what Melville did, you know. The trouble with Melville, of course, was that he was a real writer. So when you start emulating Melville, you got to write. And that's no good. Uh, and as long as you can emulate a writer who was really 99.9% .9 personality and 1% talent, then you're in business because then you can become a personality yourself. You grow a beard, you know, and you go out and shoot giraffes, and you yell and holler. And, and uh, you know, uh, you, you see, the late Robert Ruark was one of the classic examples of the of the of the uh, uh, of the almost writer, you know, who figured that if he could sit in the in the in the uh, in the shadow of Mount Kilimanjaro, he would write like what that group always considers the great man. It's a curious thing to watch, uh, and and this uh, this this hang up. I have never never seen any people. I've never never seen anything written about this. I wonder why not. Uh, I'm talking about people who write learned theses on literature. I'm talking about guys who take their. It would be a great subject for a PhD PhD discourse, a dissertation. It really would. Uh, the the uh, particularly in American letters is the urge of American writers to somehow identify themselves with a profession that is diametrically opposed to the profession that they themselves follow. Uh, the, the urge to be a truck driver. Many of them worship truck drivers. Many of them uh, worship at the... Uh, Algren is a classic example of this. Uh, and, and most of them, of course, uh, do it... Uh, at first, it starts out unconsciously. And then it becomes very conscious, and then it becomes self-conscious. It goes through three phases until finally it becomes very, it becomes kind of a joke. Uh, it, it gets to the point where Norman Mailer will write a long article on how he Indian wrestled with Cassius Clay. Oh, you know, Kerouac is, of course, a, a great example of that, too. But, but not really, because Kerouac keeps writing, you know. 
Uh, he keeps writing his own stuff. He keeps trying to, to, to write uh, his, his own novels, and I'm not saying, you know, there at least he does that. But if Kerouac stopped writing and started to write about the time he and Mailer had a wrestling match on 7th Avenue, and about the time he one time uh, had a big argument with Rocky Marciano, and Marciano backed down, boy, when he saw how tough he really was. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the poor, sad things that guys like Mailer do. They really do. They write these endless articles about the time the Indian wrestled with Cassius Clay. Now, who reads this? Well, non-readers. Are you aware that there's, uh, there's also a non-reader just as there is a non-writer? And <laughs> he is the guy who much prefers reading books about Hemingway than to read Hemingway. Hemingway can be a little troublesome, you know. You've got to read. That's a pretty long book, and it's got funny words, and he keeps hollering, you know, Spanish phrases and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so you'll find more guys read about Hemingway than ever read Hemingway. And today, I, there aren't many books of criticism about Hemingway out. There are a lot of books like uh, The Time I Met Hemingway in Oak Park once. Uh, there are books about an appreciation of the time that Hemingway shot the bull moose in the woods, and I was there, and I was right there with him, and I handed him the gun, and all that jazz. Oh, yeah, nobody writes about Hemingway's writing. Uh, very few. They'll write about the time Hemingway had an argument with Fitzgerald in a cafe in Paris while he was writing A Farewell to Arms. <laughs> but they don't write much about whether A Farewell to Arms was a good book or a bad book. And uh, that'll come later, I suppose, when all these guys have disappeared into the oblivion where they rightfully belong. I'm talking about the, the, uh, the clingers, the literary clingers to the world of the literati. Incidentally, that word is what it really means, literati. It does not mean literary creators. It means just like the hangers around. Just like there is the, uh, this, there is the theater I, <laughs> uh, there is the hanger around the theater. There are millions of them who never miss a first night, who have long, uh, they have collections of playbills, and, and they read every word that Walter Kerr ever writes. And uh, they don't really like plays, or, you know, they don't really like that sort of thing. They like to read about plays. They like to, that whole, you know, that whole mystique of being involved in something, but not really, is, is part, so much part of our world. And uh, you'll, you'll pick up book after book. There's the, I, I'm, I'm constantly surprised that nobody has written about this yet. It would make a fascinating uh, book on the American writer and his dream of becoming a light heavyweight. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this was, uh, well, it is escapism in a way, but it's intellectual escapism, which is another kind of thing. It's fascinating that most of the people who write this, this junk and who read this crud do not believe that they're intellectually escaping. Oh, no, they're being very intellectual. Oh, they, they think of themselves as a, a fantastic inner circle of the intellectual, creative, fermenting life of New York City. And they're not really creating anything. You know, they're, they're constantly writing about other people who have created something. And so there will be a great horde of people who will gather around memoirs of the time Andy Warhol said hello to me. You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, there's far more, uh, uh, far more reputations are made by hanging around people and by being around them than ever was created in this day and age than ever created by doing things. Every, are you aware that every creative writer, any guy who writes and has achieved any kind of, uh, fame at all in this field? Uh, writing, I'm not talking about any creative field, even radio I'm talking about. I'll talk about radio, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about, uh, the play, the, the theater world, that there's always a great little knot of people who hang around each one of them and who somehow feel that it's rubbing off and always refer to what uh, the man does in the we terms, uh, in, even if it's only inside of himself. And so around a guy like Allen Ginsberg, who after all did write a poem, there's a whole little coterie of guys who somehow identify themselves with what Ginsberg did. Uh, around Kerouac, there's a whole little mob of guys who somehow associate themselves with what Kerouac did. Uh, around almost any one of these people, there's, there's a whole little, uh, a little misty crowd of people hanging around. And of course, these people drop them like, uh, you can't believe how quickly they drop them once the critics turn on the object uh, or the core of their life. Uh, the minute, the minute uh, the critic lands on, on Baldwin and really says the truth, he's a very bad novelist. Baldwin has written some of the worst, <laughs> the worst, well-received novels that have hit the stands in the last ten years. Uh, but the minute the critics start saying it, you will find these people peel off. They'll peel off like like the leaves in the autumn. 
and it's a it's a fascinating thing to watch. Now, I don't know, uh, doing a show like this, I suppose, uh, uh, sometimes bores large numbers of people. I, I happen to be fascinated by the world of writing, and uh, I I do my own writing for fun. I enjoy doing it. That's the end of it. I make no mo no great wild uh, all inclusive comments about it. I am not attempting to evoke a time uh, to attach it to our time with the deep inner significance of the decadence and the downfall of Western civilization. I wish I could be a left left handed pitcher bit, you know, that kind of jazz. But uh, I I do know large numbers of them, and uh, I I know that that one of the saddest one of the one of the first signs of the downfall of a writer that I have known in my time, personally, I'm talking about, is when I will find writing friends of mine suddenly start talking about Willie Pep. When I hear them suddenly start, uh, in loud voices, arguing whether or not the Yankees are a better ball club than the Detroit Tigers, then I know something is beginning to happen, and I'm not putting that down, I mean, but I'm, uh, then I begin to know when they begin to associate themselves. When, when uh, I, I'm waiting for the first writer to associate himself with pro football, who sees himself as a great quarterback, with a with a fantastic hook pass in the world of literary, you know, the world of literary achievement, he sees himself as a kind of Y A tittle of the Canto field. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, of great literary achievements, here's a piece of poetry. There's a great new look in Gimbel's... Please, maybe a little poetry music there. No, that's it, that's it. There's a great new look in Gimbel's men's shop these days. Yes, Gimbel's takes extreme pleasure in welcoming the timely clothes fine line of men's suits. Timely clothes have long been noted for their youthful, whoopy, high fashion look. Their skinny pants and tailoring for the fit and feel that you like. It grabs you right where you want to be grabbed. And in the timely clothes fall collection which has just arrived at Gimbel's, high standards of tailoring, yes sirree baby, are apparent. Whoopy, zowie, crash, bang. This is a pop art commercial. Wow, wow, wow. Gimbal's spotlights two important groups of suits. Rasmataz and a Rudy Rudy too. Ba, ba, da, ba. Available on time. You can pay it when you can afford it, man. Go down to Gimbal's. Shop at Gimbal's. Man, shop. Ba, 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 da, ba, 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 da, ba, da, 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 How's that for a commercial? Listen, it would cost them an arm and a leg if they came to pay me to do that. And they got it free, and you watch, they'll complain about it. <laughs> they'll com yes, they will. They'll complain about it. Let me tell you this. Anybody that... All right, bring on the theme. Oh, no, not yet. Anybody that pays for something loves it. Anybody that gets it free, he screams bloody murder. Now, while we're on the subject of screaming bloody murder, I, I'm just... I, I'd like to suggest... I'd like to hear from some of you guys out there that are majoring in American lit... I really would. I'd like to see what you think of the idea um, as a Ph.D. treatise, as a Ph.D. treatise in American literature, what there is in the American air, what there is in this, uh, this thing, this literal that we live in, that makes writer after writer, almost to a man, begin to associate himself with X price fighters, particularly the punch drunk type. What is there in our world? I don't know. It's a fascinating theme. And I, I don't know that it's been really explored. In fact, I have never heard anybody explore it yet. What makes poor old Algren think that if Algren hadn't learned to write, sort of, at one point in his life, he could have well become the welterweight challenger? What makes Norman Mailer think that uh, somewhere underneath that rough, curly-headed exterior, there lies the lithe, angry soul of the heavyweight champ. What is this? What? What? The, it, 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 did it start with Hemingway? I don't know. That would be part of the discourse. Or did Hemingway pick it up from some other fighter sitting in some bar in Paris, talking about Furpo and Dempsey? Ah, yeah, ah, yeah, I'd like to get in there and slug it out with Dempsey and Furpo. Well, I don't know. Where did it all begin? It did not appear, you know, in Henry James's work. And he was an American. It certainly did not appear in Melville. At what point did it begin to emerge? This great belief that if I could just get on the gloves, if I could stand in that cool, bright, searing light at Madison Square Garden and hear the announcer, and in the corner to my left, weighing at 116 pounds, the heavyweight challenger from Hoboken, the Norman Left Hook Mela. 
And in the right corner, weighing in at 93 pounds, the heavyweight champ, James Baldwin, uh, from Harlem, New York, the champion of the world. This is WOR Radio, your station for news. Palisades has the rights, Palisades has the fun. Come on over.